Good afternoon and thank you all for joining us. I'm Luigi Zingales, the faculty director of the Stigos Center and the co-host of the podcast Capital Isn't. We're delighted today to continue our Monopolies and Politics workshop series today with Mirza Barad Baradam and Eli Cook on anti-monopoly pressure groups in the United States. This is la the last webinar in, in the series for this quarter, but we plan to unpack the rest of the topics in our annual antitrust and competition conference that uh, was supposed to take place this year in a series of webinar in October. So please make sure you sign up to receive updates on the Stigler Center website. Please remember we are on the record and recording. After the discussion, the last 15 minutes will be devoted to Q&A, so please submit your questions via the Q&A button on Zoom, and I will moderate the questions. Before we begin, allow me to briefly introduce our distinguished guests. Mirza Baradaran is a professor of law at the University of California at Irvine School of Law. Previously, she was the Robert Cotton Alstom Chair in Corporate Law, and the Associate Dean for Strategic Initiatives with a focus on diversity and inclusion efforts at the University of Georgia School of Law. Mercer writes about banking law, financial inclusion, inequality, and the racial wealth gap, among other things. She is an award-winning author of two books, um, How the Other Half Banks and The Color of Money, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap. Eli Cook is an Assistant Professor of American History at Haifa University in Israel. He received his PhD from Harvard University and is the author of the award-winning book, The Pricing of Progress, Economic Indicators and the Capitalization of American Life, which discusses the rise of economic indicators in the emergence of modern capitalism and the contested history of English enclosure, Caribbean slavery, American industrialization, economic thought and, econo and corporate power among others. So um, I'm gonna start by asking uh, two questions, uh, one, one question each to Eli and Mercer, and they will speak for uh, 10 minutes each, and then we're gonna have a more uh, intense uh, debate among us. And um, um, to Eli, I wanna start by asking, um, we know there is a long tradition of antitrust in the United States. Uh, the United States is the country uh, that invented antitrust uh, back uh, in, the, in the 19th century. And so I want to start with uh, the earlier part of this history and understand to some extent the political economy of the early antitrust uh, creation and enforcement. So uh, what are the um, coalitions that supported the emergence of the Sherman Act from the Grunge movement to the emergence of the Sherman Act and how it unfolded during the progressive era, so up to, let's say, the Clayton Act. The floor is yours, Eli. Thank you, and thank you for having me. This is a, a great opportunity. Um, so I, I think I'm gonna give this very briefly the standard narrative, and then I'm gonna challenge that a little. So the standard narrative is usually when people, people talk about antitrust, they really stress the progressive era. The, the Gilded Age is perceived of this era, of rampant concentration and giant monopolies. And then these kind of middle class, white, upper middle class, even reformers came along, along with some presidents, your Roosevelt's, your Woodrow Wilson's, and they kind of really instituted these regulatory, mostly reforms that um, were kind of really meant to challenge kind of like the big corporate power of uh, the Gilded Age. And I think this standard argument about kind of the move from the Gilded Age to the progressive era is very much still with us. And, and even the term progressive era shows how we have framed the history and periodization. Clearly the term progressive era has a much more positive ring to it than the Gilded Age. Uh, but in my brief time today, I wanna to challenge that narrative uh, and offer a, a different historiography, one that was very popular actually in the United States in the 1960s and 70s. It was called the corporate liberal argument. And what's interesting about it is that it was an argument that was shared by both parts of the new left, but also parts of the libertarian right. And I think that's a very interesting uh, uh, kind of uh, coalition, at least intellectually speaking. 
And this narrative actually claims that really it was the Gilded Age in which, you know, the Sherman Act in 1890, where, where corporations were really being challenged at a number of different levels. Uh, and, and, and really the competition amongst them was actually quite robust. If you read kind of the archives from this period, the term ruinous competition comes up a lot amongst these kind of businessmen and they actually feel like they're not doing enough in order to stabilize and rationalize this new economy. Uh, so for instance, uh, they're being pressured by local groups. There are state laws that they're terrified of, whether it's railroad regulation or in other instances, they're very worried that there's gonna be a patchwork system where you know, each state will have its own regulations. And oftentimes the people who are pushing these regulations are in the state senates, and these are like the populist farmers, or maybe these kind of middle class, and even sometimes working class constituencies. And even I would say in some cases, even in, within cities, there's also a working class, a kind of urban populist push that is also pressuring a lot of these uh, corporations. And I would say actually that if you look at the Gilded Age, and I've actually written about this, uh, inequality there is rising, but not nearly as much as in the progressive era. And I think it's time that we kind of change the way we look at the progressive era through this vision of the corporate liberals. Because what they claim is actually that if you look at the main kind of big regulations that the federal government took on itself, even the antitrust ones, a lot of times you see that behind the scenes that some of the people who were pushing for this were actually some of the bigger corporations themselves. They saw this as an opportunity to kind of stabilize a chaotic, a free market system, to kind of do away with this ruinous capitalism, to create a more predictable uh, um, uh, system. So in, in many ways, what I'm arguing here is that sometimes I think we need to turn the historiography almost on its head. Uh, instead of seeing someone as Roosevelt as this great trust buster, I think we need to see him as someone who is very critical about certain forms of economic concentration and certain forms of monopoly. But on the other hand, in many ways, he was naturalizing and, and legitimizing many other forms of bigness. It's, I think Roosevelt and in general, the progressive era, and if you look at the first reports of the Bureau of Comp Corporations, one of the first things they note there is how, you know, because of economies of scale, bigness is kind of natural. There's nothing we can do about it. And, and, and that is a very different narrative than, than the Gilded Age. In the Gilded Age, actually, there was this notion, which again comes back to this kind of laissez-faire free market notion, that if you're big, you must be doing something wrong. You must be cheating. You must be manipulating the system somehow, because otherwise it, it wouldn't have happened. And so I think it's very important that we kind of shift it, because I think a lot of times um, when we look at the pr progressive era, we feel as if this is the model for antitrust. And when I look at it kind of broader, I think that actually you see that a lot of the problems we're dealing with today with, with uh, monopoly and concentration is actually problems that in some ways began with the progressive era. And here I'm talking mostly about these kind of big technocratic institutions, which can oftentimes suffer from regulatory capture. And I think this dream that the progressives had, especially kind of these reformer elite white middle class of these kind of experts that will depoliticize the economy and they'll take over and they'll, I think, I think that's a very dangerous way of looking at things because I think in the end, usually our regulatory um, institutions are gonna reflect our politics. And if we have great power asymmetries within the uh, society and within the, you know, uh, the difference between labor and capital, that's gonna reflect itself in these, in these regulatory institutions. And sure enough, if you look at the Federal Reserve, the FTC, the ICC and all sorts of other institutions in this time, you see that they really didn't do a good enough job, if you ask me, at really br breaking up large corporations. Of course, we have the example of the Standard Oil, but I think in many times that's an exception to the rule, more than kind of like a symbol for the era. And I think in many ways, and I know Mercer's gonna talk about this, so I'm not gonna talk, go any further about this. I think the New Deal is actually a much more kind of antitrust era because the politics and the under, underlying power uh, uh, um, uh, relations had changed and that thus allowed for a different uh, um, regulatory apparatus. And I just want to give ver two very brief examples. Um, today there's wonderful literature about how the consumer welfare standard with Robert Bork in the 1970s and 80s really led us astray and it created this kind of uh, efficiency that doesn't re uh, minded argument that doesn't really look at politics. It doesn't really look at power. It basically said, you know, if things are cheap, and it's okay to allow mergers to happen. 
You know, it doesn't matter if they're, we're creating these kind of corporate monsters. And first of all, this was not at all the narrative in the Gilded Age. This was more of a progressive narrative where there was a time of inflation, there was a time of rising prices, and people were talking constantly about cost of living, cost of living. And I think one of the mistakes that we've made in the neoliberal era is borrowing from this cost of living argument a little bit too much to the detriment of kind of serious entry trust. And the other example I could give, although there were others, is of course the Federal Reserve. I think uh, if you know the history of the Federal Reserve, I think it's a classic example. And it's oftentimes it's not lumped together with the other uh, progressive reforms. But to me, when I look at what's happening to the American economy at this very moment in these days, I think it's clear that one of our obstacles to real uh, uh, antitrust and real uh, breaking up of giant corporations is that we need to rethink uh, the politics of uh, monetary uh, uh, policy and the politics of who exactly gets you know, this money that the Federal Reserve prints and who doesn't. And I think in this sense, if we, again, just to wrap up what I'm saying, we need to begin to look at the progressive era in a more critical way. Now, I'm not talking about Brandeis. Brandeis is wonderful, but I think sometimes Brandeis becomes kind of like a, the symbol of the entire era. And in many ways, I would say that I think in a lot of instances, uh, Brandeis was actually on the losing side of the battle. And it was on the winning side where these kind of corporate liberals, these kind of for, forward seen businessmen who realized that if we, we needed regulation, but they chose federal regulation because they felt that that was something that they could control, control more. And they gave up maybe a little bit of their own kind of power, but in many ways they did so in order to, to legitimize the very corporate system that in the Gilded Age, I would say, from unions, from uh, other grassroots movements was actually uh, under attack far more uh, than in the progressive era. Thank you very much, uh, Irai. Uh, Mercer, the, the second golden period of antitrust was the New Deal, and not necessarily at the beginning with the National Recovery Act, but uh, uh, mostly afterward with the appointment of Arnold Thurum uh, to the Attorney General. So, um, what are the coalitions that supported this movement and in what way it's similar to what Eli was saying, was saying it's different? Um, yeah, so I largely agree with uh, Eli that, you know, in the progressive revival, as we go toward, you know, a new New Deal or new progressive era, new anti-monopoly, that we take a hard look at what that coalition, how that coalition succeeded. And, you know, I will say in my own, you know, scholarly analysis of this, right, the first book that I looked at all of my heroes in, you know, I studied banking. So if you look at the conglomeration and the power accumulation of banks and the, the counters to that were, you know, Wilson's uh, Federal Reserve, you have, you know, the Clayton Act, you've got the FDR um, New Deal Coalition. Um, and then, you know, my second book, I actually just take the, the through line of race. And so those are the heroes in the first book, the progressives, the New Deal era um, coalitions. In the second book, I, I look at um, how these affected the black uh, racial, the black white racial wealth gap and black banks in particular. And it turns out that the heroes of anti monopoly and progressivism in the first book are the villains in the second book. They're the very same people, the very same coalitions of Southern agrarian farmers and, um, you know, to some extent, Northern Democrats, but mostly it's a Southern populist to progressive. Um, uh, sort of movement and 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 so I, I have I don't I'm not saying it was necessary this that the white supremacy was a, a central part of this I'm still working out what what exactly it is but I do have a couple of um, theories of, 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 of what this could be so um, uh, localism I, I mean just just kind of as an empirical matter localism and banking hurt black communities a lot localism in New Deal policy localism in progressive policy um, was a way for white supremacist organizations in the south and especially in um, you know uh, through farm loan acts and progressive uh, Wilson era and, and New Deal era any of those benefits localism was a way to cut off black labor from those benefits, collective bargaining, um, all of that did not include black labor. Um, and then several black economists, Abram Harris, uh, who was the sh first Chicago black economist, um, mentioned, you know, said that the only way for black industry to succeed is for some branching abilities, specifically in banking. Though I'm not going to glamorize, I mean, Chase Manhattan did a lot of damage by, you know, taking deposits in black communities and lending them and others. So this is not a, you know, pro-monopoly argument at all. Um, so, um, 
and the other, you know, the other thing, the caveat I will say before I, I talk about the, the other things is that the populist party, the early populists in the South didn't start that way. And so relying on some of C, C. Van Woodward's work and others, um, you know, Tom Watson, um, Frederick Douglass, there was an early populist coalition was a, you know, we're all in the ditch together, so to speak. We're all sharecroppers and the oligarchs are over there. So we need to black and white join forces to de defeat the monopolists, the, you know, the, the money uh, trusts, whatever um, it was. But those, that coalition was not successful. Um, and it wasn't successful. They couldn't beat the Southern Democrats. And the Southern Democrats were successful using white supremacy as a uh, tool to build a broader coalition that the populists were ever able to assemble. So theory one is this was an accident. Uh, it was an accident that it just so happened that white supremacists and uh, the racial ordering was, it, you know, came up in the same breath as, as progressivism and anti-monopoly. That's, that's one theory. Um, the other is, you know, this, the po pol political coalition theory, that it was a necessary political strategy to form a successful anti-monopoly, anti-power coalition. You needed uh, white supremacy. You needed a we the people against monopoly power that excluded some necessarily. And part of that exclusion may have been that we have to feed some labor into the maw of industrial capitalism. It's just, it's not gonna be white laborers. It's going to be some other immigrant or black um, labor. That, that's a, a more, there, there's also a, a third, you know, more, more you know, um, th that there's a logical link to scientific progressivism, um, D Darwinism, which was, I think you can't underestimate the influence of a Darwinian um, scientific theories on progressive thought. I mean, the progressive era, I mean, it was a lot of reliance on science, specifically um, Wilson to, you know, even FDR's um, brain trust until, you know, until the, um, uh, you know, the, the rise of the Third Reich, this was a huge um, uh, core of progressive um, thought, eugenics, racial eugenics, a lot of this stuff was part and parcel of, of progressivism. And, and so I think perhaps the third theory is that it was a logical link. Um, and, you know, there's, there was a superior sort of common man uh, theory of change. And, and, and the, you did have also some progressive theorists say, say, saying things like, oh, the monopolists are just um, the worst predators of nature. And they kind of got wrapped up in that theory of, you know, they just succeeded because they were especially shrewd or whatever. And again, there's anti-Semitism, I think, wrapped up in some of that. Um, and then, uh, so those are the three. Um, the other thing, you know, I think I will close off with is if you look at the current debate among the left, so the Sanders Coalition, and then about uh, analyzing the Trump phenomenon of the class versus race, um, how to build coalitions. I mean, I think you can trace that directly through, you know, from Jefferson to Jackson to Wilson to, you know, FDR um, to now class and race are not, are, are inextricably tied. And they were also um, a, a useful way that class um, coalitions were built. And, and I don't know um, what to do with that, except to say that that line, if you thread from Jefferson to Jackson to Trump um, uh, through to, you know, George Wallace um, was a progressive tradition. And it was a, um, the only, uh, it was an agrarian, you know, uh, uh, local, local um, anti-monopolist tradition. And so I, I don't, I don't know pre prescriptively what to say about that because I do think we have a monopoly problem and I do think we have to, you know, um, break down uh, the way, the break down these firms the way the progressive dibs did. So the outcomes were good, but I, I, I guess my, my thoughts are on the um, uh, coalition um, building. So uh, I will uh, stop there and just to, just to like Eli said, um, take a hard look at, at, at the way that the successes, what were some of the things that are outside that scope? But Marissa, I, I wish you'd spend a little bit more time on, on the later part of uh, the anti-monopoly tradition and, and this is the, the New Deal and the later part of the New Deal. So um, we all have read probably the book Matt Stoller that uh, defends uh, Patnam as his hero uh, and um, to some extent uh, push under the rug the fact that uh, was not exactly uh, progressive from a race point of view. Uh, do, how do you see somebody like Patna, for example? 
Yeah, you know, so one of the things I will say, and, and this goes again back to Eli. Uh, so Patman, I think, uh, uh, was, uh, Patman was uh, a Southern, I mean, he was, a, a, you know, and I, I, like, I, I disagree with Matt on, on these points. I think his heroes were, um, you know, I think a, a lot of progressives, uh, Stoller among others will say things like, you know, they were great, but for these views on race and, and, and it's a qualification. And I, I would say, no, there was no coalition, but for their views on race, it, it was part and parcel of their success, a Patman included. Um, you know, and I think you can take Lyndon Johnson before he's president and the way that he is able to rise in the Southern Bloc. I mean, the Southern Bloc was, was an impossible um, uh, thing to, to, to surpass for any Democrat. Any Democrat had to get the Southern Bloc and the Southern Bloc you know, white supremacy was among one or two top um, top points. So the same block that passed the New Deal in the, uh, uh, you know, um, the FDR era was the same block that defeated every civil rights bill that got to them, uh, defeated anti-lynching legislation. Um, so, so that I think is not, it's not like a minor point. Oh, they were great, but for this thing, it was part of the thing. Um, the other, the other thing I will say is like, you know, in my, if you take it down to the molecular level, um, on the cusp of the New Deal, you know, FDR to reform banking, um, you have the Brandeisian com concept. Again, back to Eli, I think Brandeis lost in a lot of ways. In, in, and one of the ways is um, instead of breaking up and creating local uh, banks, so let's say FDIC insurance was, was this, you know, localism and supporting localism through public fisc. Brandeis was more of a public utility. Look, look, there are some things that are important, and so let's create a public option. That's my word, but he would say a public utility. So banking, right? Banking, you can create a public utility in banking. Um, and, and in that historical tradition, it was postal banking. We had live postal banks on the cusp of 1933. It was a very successful um, effort. It was taken up by um, immigrants who were coming from Italy, who were coming from, you know, um, other European countries or other places that understood postal banks because they had it in Europe. So you can choose postal banking and create this public federal, very scary sort of treasury backed um, system, or you can do FDIC insurance. And FDR chose FDIC insurance, I think with very consequential effects. And, but FDIC insurance was a, a giveaway to Southern um, community bankers, and it um, it was a way to survive to to let this um, local banks th thrive, even though market competition would never have allowed for it. Right, monopolizing banks were much more efficient, and so you know I think one way Brandeis loses is to instead of creating public utilities, we just backstop more local um, institutions, and so that I think is is uh, something that if we go back, I would like to revive the Brandeisian progressive strain. You know, you emphasize a very important point that I've not heard uh, before, but it, it seems uh, quite important that uh, in the progressive era, part of the push toward uh, more antitrust was to contain uh, prices that uh, are rising. And, uh, um, and in a sense, uh, part of the interest, uh, uh, for example, that uh, Paul had for deregulation in the 70s was exactly that in the period of inflation you are trying to push in that direction. So can you elaborate more who were sort of uh, behind uh, uh, the, those ideas? And to what extent that uh, today, the problem seems to be more deflation than inflation. So doesn't this mean that uh, there's no chance of any antitrust? Uh, so it's a great question. So I think uh, the key thing I think is that when you frame the problem of concentration only as an issue of prices, then very quickly, oftentimes, you discover there's something called economies of scale. And actually, a lot of times, these giant mergers and these enormous are more economically efficient. Now, the Brandeisian and the populist kind of vision was that I don't care if prices are cheaper. That's not the most important thing to me. There are other things that are more important than just lowering the cost of living. And we can talk about who exactly wins when prices go down. Because remember, there's this whole issue here about lowering the cost of labor. So if I can lower the costs of goods, but I can also lower the inputs that go into human beings, this is something I write about in my book, then I can still profit from this. So, so in this sense, I think we need to really be concerned about taking these kind of arguments and turning them instead of into from robust pop, pop, political 
democracy arguments into something much more narrow about, you know, okay, what's the price of our iPhone going to be if we're going to let these two, uh, two companies? And that, to me, is something that emerged in the progressive era, that language of talking about it only through prices. And that's the moment when someone like Nelson Aldrich, who uh, in many ways I would actually consider a progressive, in some, he's the, you know, also the brain behind the Federal Reserve, he and other people in these bureaus of statistics are creating these new metrics, we call them now cost of living, that in a sense, in the end, legitimize a lot of the monopolies that are being merged, just like the consumer welfare standards that would come along later. And, and I want to just add something to, to what Mercer said, and about Matt Stoller's book. I think uh, it, uh, the race thing is really crucial. But if you look at Wright Patman and see him also as a racist, which I agree, is he still, the narrative here really doesn't make sense as the progressive era being the key moment. Because of course, Wright Patman, he's really coming out of the populist tradition. And so I think uh, uh, what you talked about, about the public choice is really important. I think one of the key differences between the progressives and the populists was that when it came to you know, things like money, the railroads, what I would call the infrastructure of the market, the populists wanted to nationalize it. They wanted that to be run by the government and everything else would be small markets. So you would have, you know, natural monopolies would be controlled by the government and then you would have a lot of small com competitors. This is not the vision of the progressive era. The vision of the progressive era is no, we, we're not gonna nationalize the railroads like the populists wanted. We're not gonna nationalize the banking like the populists wanted. And I encourage people to read Thomas McCune's sub-treasury program. It's a brilliant idea about how you can use these wheat silos as ways to create. But um, no, what they wanted to do was regulate these private monopolies. And one of the arguments that I make and others make about this consumer liberal is that you better be really, have really strong regulators if your plan is to regulate these giant private monopolies. And, and I'll just add one last thing about the public option, which is crucial. You can have public options and still talk a language of com competition and antitrust because you're creating a public option that will compete with the private one. So I think that's also something that's lost oftentimes in these debates. And I agree that, that Brandeis also saw it this way. No, so mainly is uh, the influence for where I sit, but uh, when I hear Eli talking about uh, basically uh, the antitrust movement in the progressive era being captured by uh, basically the large producers, uh, it sounds very much like uh, uh, Chicago and Spiegler at, uh, at their best. Uh, so do you, do you agree, I, I will let him to respond to this provocation, but I, do you agree with this vision? To, to what extent uh, the big industrialists of the era bought uh, federal regulation as a way to uh, block local regulation and as a way to gain more power. I mean, I read Eli's work, and I think I, uh, I think he's right. I, I, I don't. I guess I should say he, he's the expert on this. I don't know. I do believe it. I will say that the. Um, the way that the administrative state has developed really bolsters his thesis in that it's so much easier to capture one, you know, administrative agency if you're, you know, one of your big, big company and you'd rather just send that off to an agency and I'll deal with them. I don't need to deal with Congress. And so I think what you've seen a lot in, in this regulation is just, just, you know, it's actually lowered the cost of industrialists to fight anti-monopoly legislation. And, and you know, to, we're not fighting much, right? The public, the agencies aren't fighting much, but it's just, you know, not just, you know, it, it could be a, a capture through um, ideas. And I think that's that's part of what's been, and I think Eli, Eli's right in that it, focusing on prices, and I would say also focusing on the demand side, the consumer credit, the, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the way that so much of the progressive era um, reforms focused on uh, building consumer consumption. So it was very demand side. It was also very credit based. And there's lots of hi historical accidents or reasons why we're, we're um, at that level. But it was once you create that consumer credit economy as a way toward reform, it really only goes one way. And I think we are um, looking at the financialization. Of, so one is financialization and two is just um, debt as a way to bridge the gap um, that labor 
uh, activism has not been able to do. And so I think this, this is where when we're looking at the new progressive reforms, and I, I admit that I fall into this as well. A lot of my solutions are like, okay, well, what credit program can we use? And part of that is the constraints that sort of neoliberal, you know, the CBO office and, and the way that we think about budgets and deficits um, has, has really constrained our, our thinking that you have to use credit. But part of the use of credit was uh, this, this progressive era you know, ideology of, of you know, um, demand side focus and creating consumers and looking at prices as opposed to, you know, the Polyani, I guess, um, looking at uh, political economies. We had earlier in this series, uh, Tomaki Lipon. I don't know if you know uh, him and his work. Uh, and he's a big supporter of the view that uh, uh, the European Union is uh, this great enforcer of competition and so on and so forth. But if I have to use your lenses and look at Europe from your lenses, uh, I get a much different perspective because this is there where large corporations are trying to centralize in Brussels all the power to capture them and to actually reduce competition, be more influential over all the stuff. So where do you fall in this uh, spectrum? Uh, so uh, first of all, I want to answer your provocation because it's, it's true. Uh, uh, so Gabriel Coco, which was this, he was a real leftist who wrote about this corporate liberal argument in the 1960s. And when the book comes out, who of course loves the book more than everyone else? The libertarians are like, oh, finally, someone who's talking about regulatory capture. And Coco got very upset. He was like, no, that's not, you know, that wasn't my point. But I think it's exactly the point that um, it, the, 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 there are, you know, there is a shared notion here that I don't think that you can just assume that the technocrats are going to be on the, on the right side. Experts oftentimes come from very elite classes. There's a class analysis here that can't be ignored. They're oftentimes, by the way, white, usually. They're oftentimes usually men. And so, um, and also, of course, exactly as Mercer said, you know, it's much easier in some ways to send the lobbyists out to one place instead of, you know, dealing with these grassroots movements. Of course, where I differ, though, from the Stiglers of the world is with our solution. And I would say that what we need are much more robust democratic movements that allow us, and in some cases, I would certainly offer public options as a much more uh, a powerful way of dealing with the problem of uh, a monopoly than, you know, obviously this idea that if we just break things up, things will remain small and tiny and, and so forth. So, and to get, go back to the New Deal, I think uh, Roosevelt in many ways was on my side. I think if you look at the TVA program, that was a program also about creating a, a, a competition in energy. And I think uh, in other instances as well. So, so absolutely. Uh, about the, uh, the EU, I, I'm not an expert on the EU. I'm, I'm, I'm a little surprised though to hear uh, th this argument being made uh, because it certainly does not kind of feel right to me. Uh, um, I don't know. I, kn I know that the concentration problems in the United States are worse uh, than they are in Europe. But I, so I, I can't really speak to um, what happened since the EU came aboard. But just kind of my historical instincts tell me that um, when you create depoliticized institutions, and I think in many ways the EU is a depoliticized, no one really cares when there are elections to EU. And I also like to give this example when I talk about American history. In the Gilded Age, while it was only white men, 80% of people were coming out to vote to decide about political economy issues. Once the progressive era came along and it became this realm of, oh no, we're gonna let the experts decide. If you look at the percentage of people who are voting in the 1920 election, it's like 52%. So it really drops. Of course, this now we have to include women, but that's not the reason that the drop is happening. So in my, my instincts tell me that uh, uh, relying on unelected, technocrats in Brussels is, is not the way to try to create a robust anti-monopoly tradition. <laughs> okay, I, I, I buy that, but I am more skeptical about the public option. You know, I come from a country that has used the public option a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have to say, uh, if you know anything about Alitalia, for example, uh, you know that the public option has not been a success in Italy. Uh, so either has been a disaster from an efficiency point of view or even from a political point of view because I don't understand how possibly uh, if you have such a concentrated power structure 
that capture all the uh, agency will not also capture uh, the publicly owned company, uh, the state owned company. Uh, because in, in, the, in, in Italy, uh, who appoints the CEO of any, the largest oil company, is the government. But there are groups inside the government, the same political groups, that influence the government, influence the regulator, influence also that appointment. But then th that appointment multiplies their power. So I'm not so sure that the public option is really a way to deal with your issue. How do you respond to that? So I will say, I mean, one, one, one of, of course, yes, there are a myriad public options. I mean, you can look in the United States to the GSEs, right? Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac were essentially pu public, private. I think they were more private when they started having problems, but public options, the FHA, something I write about in the New Deal was a public mortgage guarantee that created redlining in America. So of course, government bureaucrats can be just as, you know, uh, captured and, 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 uh, and, you know, uh, terrible to, you know, a mi minority races than, than, than can uh, private. But the, the, the key of the public option on this monopoly conversation is, you know, you can defeat monopolies in two ways, right? You can com compete with them and kind of diminish their um, market power, um, or you can uh, break them up and, and rely on small businesses to sort of meet those needs. And I think the way, the track that we've gone, the progressives uh, went down was a very, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a Jeffersonian, like just break it down, make it small, and that that is equivalent to liberalism. And I think that that's where the, the Stoller tradition, the right patman tradition comes from. There, and, and I think there is a way to say that there is this other way to do it. And I think, you know, if you look, yes, Italy's a bad example, and Germany certainly has bad examples of bureaucracy going awry, but there's also, you know, the land banks in Germany. There are many, you know, public banks, uh, robust public banks in other countries that don't have the monopolization issues that, that we have. And so one way to defeat power is for um, a countervailing power, to use the, the Galbraithian sense, but, but, but true um, countervailing power in that it is uh, by the people. And I think this is one way that's different. And I know that the Italian democracy has its own issues, um, but at least with a public option, so if you did have a public type bank, you could vote out the administrators. If you, you know, again, like I want to compare, you know, apples to apples and oranges to oranges, and not say like, well, we have a, you know, crappy government, so anything is, you know, our democracy can't fix these problems versus a market that can. So it's, you know, we can have Google as our one monopoly on information or Facebook as our, you know, provider of all things, or you can have a government uh, response, you know, po postal banking to Bank of America. And, you know, I think you have to just compare the apples to apples, you know, with Bank of America, you actually have no, you know, um, uh, no way to vote out those board of directors, no way to change those things besides, you know, activist shareholders and, and things like that. And if they suck up enough of the market, you actually can't regulate them in a way that you could, if our democracy worked, um, to do so with a postal bank or something that was a public option. And so, uh, yes, of course, governments are just as bad as markets, um, but, but this is one way to beat monopoly once you have that kind of hold on um, the market like in banks or in tech. But, but sorry, when you say if our democracy works, you make it the working exogenous to this. But what I'm mm -hmm. saying is not, in a sense, when you have uh, a very powerful government company, uh, the yeah. government will influence on the function of democracy through those companies. And so endogenously, the democracies may worse off. That's the yeah. experience of it. But that makes it much more difficult to fix the problem. Well, I don't think there are, there, markets exist outside of government. I, mean, I, I think that, you know, I think all markets are cover, government influenced and created. Um, so, I, you know, I don't think that there is a market um, you know, without FHA loans and, and GSEs and, and, and guarantees. And so I, I think that, again, it's a, it's a false dichotomy. It's like the market's over here and the government's over here. Government agencies and the tracks create these markets. And so, you know, we might as well just be upfront about it and say, we're just going to compete directly instead of trying to steer it through the rubric of market, whatever, just pretend that this market is making decisions on its own. Okay. And uh, I already received some questions. I invite you to 
uh, ask, uh, ask some other question because pretty soon I'm going to open the floor. But let me ask uh, one final question to both, and then I will open the floor. And is, given what we learned from the past, uh, is there a hope for an anti-monopoly uh, coalition that is not uh, racist, that is not uh, this, that is not that? And if so, how would you concede that? Um, so I, I, first of all, I want to say something about the public option, because I think it really does get to the heart of the differences. I'm a populist through and through in these regards, and that means I believe in democratic, democratic institutions. And I believe that uh, elected officials uh, are never going to be as fully insulated from the pressures of the people as unelected uh, technocrats. So in that sense, I think there's actually a huge difference between you know, obviously there are enormous ways that you need to make sure that, that these government institutions these are, are run in a, a, a transparent and, and way, but, but at the end of the day, if you don't run them correctly, you can be run out of office. So call me naive, call me, uh, but I think democracy is the solution in, for a lot of these problems. And I think that assuming that the markets could do better in this case, to me is always, you know, I always talk, this that notion that, you know, people vote with their wallets or that markets, you know, I always say, you know, Dollar, it's just a completely, uh, when you have such rampant inequality as we have today, the notion to me that uh, we're just gonna, you know, let the market do it se seems worse. It, it just seems worse. And then the other thing is, I think, uh, I think we need to question also, you know, who gets to be an interest group? Because when it's a regulatory system, I think a lot of times it, you see this kind of revolving door of bankers who become regulators. And I agree that when it's a government institution, you have other problems. You might have labor unions who have much, too much mm -hmm. power. Frankly, I think we're in a position right now in America where that, that should be our worries, that, that, that the labor unions are, have way too much power in government-run offices. And they're, you know, I, think, I think we've moved so much to the other side that I don't think that's the thing that we need to fully worry about. And of course, the other thing is so simple and obvious, but you know, when these are public-run corporations, I think the amount of, uh, of kind of wealth that can be extracted and kind of siphoned off to private people is just much less. At the end of the day, you know, sure, there's going to be maybe nepotism and inefficiencies, but it's nothing like the enormous amounts of wealth they're just pouring into the hands of a very, very small amount of people within the private market. Now, about the racist question, I think about this a lot. And to tell you the truth, it, to me, it's still a riddle. Like, what is it about this kind of antitrust, like you were talking about local, small, kind of competitive, that, that somehow seems to not be compatible with a more um, uh, progressive uh, racial vision. And, and all I can say is that wasn't everything in American history racist? Wasn't the New Deal also racist? What, what isn't, you know, any time that we've tried to institute government reforms, look at Social Security, the most socially democratic, you know, anti-market institution, and that was super racist at first. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, I think the lesson has to be just don't, don't try to learn anything from the past because there are reasons the statues are coming down and, 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 and on the other hand, I do think we need to have a serious conversation about you know, what, what, what can we do with all of these different kind of tools in our toolbox in a world where we take the racial issue really, really, really seriously. And I think, I think that's a huge challenge. I, I really do. And, I, and, I'm not, and I'm not sure. I think this come, comes down to the only thing I can say is that to me, there is something about labor unions that and other forms of kind of grassroots institutions that seem to be becoming more and more racially diverse, uh, that they could perhaps become one of the pressure groups that kind of can really change uh, what's happening uh, in, in, in kind of like the, the big uh, hallways of, uh, of, of Congress. Rosa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm on the same page as you. I'm also a proud populist. You know, I, I, I think the more, I mean, this is a hard moment to say this, but I think the more votes, the better. I mean, I know that we keep talking about, you know, I think some, the, the, the instinct now is to like, no, take away the votes from some of these people that don't know what they're doing, you know? Um, but I think that that's a flaw in our democracy. I mean, the electoral college, the, the gerrymandering, the money in politics. I think if you reform all that and just create a pure vote, and again, like back to what Eli was saying, 
everything is about race. And then before it was about race, everything was about slavery. And so the way that we were dealing with this constitution that was meant to uphold this very you know, specific system of labor exploitation, and you, yet we're still constrained by these checks on the vote and the democracy. And so I think, you know, yes, I believe in uh, that we can beat sort of, you know, the, the monopolies and the power centers. We ne need to do it through uh, more, more votes and more open channels of democracy. And it is, it's maybe naive um, to think that it can be done, but it would have to start with that. It would have to start with votes counting more and not less and votes uh, and, and, you know, the, the experts am ambivalent as to what they're in charge of, but they can't, it can't be monetary policy. It cannot be a Fed insulated, you know, uh, from all political voice, all voting, um, funneling money to certain sectors, um, and that that is uh, not not a democratic um, structure. And I, I think you know what do you want? Like you know the the Trump voters of the world deciding monetary policy? No, but <laughs> you know there there's got to be a, a, an in between um, between here and there. I. I sympathize with the idea that we want more votes, but going back to the failure of public mm -hmm. monopolies in the United States, we have one thing that is a local monopoly everywhere, where the union is very powerful, it's called the police. And it works terribly. And it says, if there is a place, and now we are facing the, the issue. Why? Because the union is very powerful, is controlling everything, and is controlling the electoral process because mayors cannot run without the support of the police. They are funded by the police. So if you want to transform all the governors of America into a police, I'm not so sure you're going in the right direction. Eli, Eli. I, I've been waiting for this uh, talking point. In the last few weeks, we've noticed how uh, the police and the unions have become bleeding together. And I was, I was, uh, I, I've been anticipating these arguments. Look, I, I think uh, there are a lot of problems with uh, the police. I actually feel that uh, unions is, 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 is an actually small part of it. I think that there are bigger issues at stake. And uh, frankly, I think if other groups in, uh, in our society were as unionized as they were, then maybe we could uh, uh, challenge these. But, but uh, I, I think in this regard, I think it's uh, pa pa painting all labor unions uh, through the brush of the issues that we're having now with the police is it's it's a I, I it's a, I think it's a it's a it's a problematic argument uh, to say the mm -hmm. least. I think in many other places we see that unions are are the most diverse, uh, the most uh, uh, non-white, uh, and and I and I don't think there's something inherently uh, uh, intrinsic. But but I will go back to what Mercer was saying about the funneling of money. I think what's happening today, you know, the fact that we're not seeing. Uh, municipal bonds being bought up by the Federal Reserve, and instead we're seeing only money funneled into, you know, uh, biggest, the biggest corporations, I think this gets back to this language of depolitizing, because what the Federal Reserve says, oh, we can't do that because that's political. You know, that, that, that's something mm -hmm. that, that we, 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 we would be playing, you know, favorites. Uh, and so mm -hmm. what's happened is this weird world where the, the, the stock market and private capital markets can get unlimited amounts of credit because that's not political, but you know the very governments that we need. I was just reading an article now about New York City is going to have to make you know fire twenty two thousand uh, city workers. They can't get the funding they need because of this language of kind of what's political and what's not political. So I'll just uh, I think uh, end with that. So, and, and on the police, I think. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Luigi. No, no, you go. No, I mean I think again, like it goes back to to race. It's the least egalitarian. Um, organization in America, it was created, if you, you know, look at W.E. Du Bois' theories on, uh, you know, uh, capitalism, the police was created to enforce a certain labor structure. It was innovated in the South um, to police black labor. And I, I, I think, you know, to use the police as an example is to just point exactly onto the problem. The police don't, you know, uh, uh, brutalize all of us equally. They're hardly a presence in white suburbs. And so I think the police union is, is, is part and parcel of the problem of just police. Like you're gonna have a monopoly on violence, right? And then use that monopoly on a certain subset of the population, then we can't extrapolate any lessons from that that apply to the broader economy. The police is just the, the weapon. And I think looking at you know, my, his, histories of Iran, you know, the Iranian revolution, um, where it was, you know, there was a populist, uh, you know, anti, you know, uh, imperial uh, push that was 
brought together all of these forces and it was who got the police first was the Islamists. And they broke down all of the, the other coalitions, the populists, the socialists, the whatever, with that police power. And so I think police power is actually apart from uh, the, these other um, uh, phenomena because it, it, is, it is that that power of violence that I think is deployed particularly in certain places and not others. No, I, I completely agree. I want to clarify to Eli that I don't make all the unions equal. I think that uh, unions in competitive sectors are very important and uh, are honestly too weak in America. I think unions in the public sector where the counterpart is very weak, like the teachers unions or the police unions, etc., that are the problem. But that's exactly what makes me worried about giving some monopoly to the government, because then you are transforming all the sectors into sort of a public sector and public sector unions, where the unions are problematic. So anyway. Uh, no, I, I, I understand that point. And, and I have to say, right now, is Amer I'm from Israel, where we have these bigger questions about public unions. The United States, it seems like we don't have to deal with that yet because just, you know, the public sector is so kind of been <laughs> destroyed and empty that, uh, but you're right. When we get to that bridge, we're gonna, those are challenges we need to deal with. Um, and by the way, it's precisely because uh, the police was so powerful, was a monopoly, state monopoly, that the Iranian revolution could take over. You know, I always bring the example of Italy. In Italy, we have multiple polices, and the reason why we have multiple polices is to make it difficult for anybody to do a coup d'etat. Because it, when uh, the police goes on one side, the carabinieri goes on the other, and vice versa. And so I think that, uh, again, a little bit of anti-monopoly can be useful there too. But anyway, I want to open to uh, people. Uh, and uh, there, is, there is Anil Abba who would say, in the digital age, fight against monopolies without international cooperation is hardly unlikely to be successful. However, competition at times is a national matter for racing countries, like uh, the case of Boeing, Airbus, and etc. Now, Google, Facebook, YouTube, Apple are considered as the national firms of the United States, whereas Spotify is Europe's and Huawei, China, and so on and so forth. So these countries are actually reluctant to split and weaken their own companies. How do you think this conflict would be resolved? So, Mercer, why don't you start? Um, actually, can Eli take this one? I'm not sure. I need okay. to think through it a little bit more. Are you okay, <laughs> Eli, go ahead. So, uh, Anil <laughs> Abba, you would, yeah. you would have made the corporate liberals proud because one of the arguments for why the progressive era was so, in the end, fairly monopolist was imperialism. Uh, for, for those who don't know, it's the progressive era that really we see America and giant American corporations beginning to export a lot of their uh, goods and beginning to care about markets you know, outside of the United States. This is when they conquered you know, Cuba and the Philippines and the Spanish-American War. Mm -hmm. And I uh, recommend people read William Appleman Williams, a great historian from about 50 years ago. And he made this exact argument. He said, one of the reasons that governments became pro-monopoly was because they felt that they were competing with other countries. And therefore, if they broke up these giant companies, it, they would be hurting their stature in global competition. So I think it's a fantastic point. I think it shows that a lot of times domestic policy and foreign policy are very intertwined. And mm -hmm. I think that in the end of the day, America made a very clear decision and they decided that it was more important for them to be an empire than it was for them to have, uh, you know, small uh, competitive, competitive businesses. And I have to say, I do, all, all I can say it, as far as, you know, how do you solve this problem is that I think in some ways it might be a matter of priorities. It might really be a question of, yes, I might lose some of my market share overseas if I break up Facebook or, or Amazon, um, but I think it's worth it uh, for you know, the political equality and questions, but uh, I don't have some you know, magic solution in this case. And I think it's very important to remember these things are not happening in a vacuum, it's happening within you know, a global uh, competition and not just the internal one. I'm sorry, I'm, I don't I'm know glad. Anil. So I don't know Anil who asked the question, but I think that uh, you mischaracterize, at least maybe I read it poorly, but I, mis I think you mischaracterize it a little bit his position. He's not endorsing his position. He's saying that's a political reality. So sure. uh, how do you win an election when uh, 
uh, Mark Zuckerberg, when he goes in front of Congress, as a note in front of him, rem remind uh, all the speakers how oh, this is important for America. And yep. this is an argument that whether you like it or not, fly and fly big time. And That's so what point. is your best shot at uh, addressing this argument? Uh, Melissa, do you want to start? And, yeah. And yeah, so um, I was actually testifying in Congress this week, last week, I don't know what happened to time, but um, talking about uh, uh, providing a public option, um, you know, through postal accounts, through, for whatever, whatever it was. And the Republican talking point was that China, I mean, so, so the, 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 the issue, and, and there's going to be another uh, um, Senate uh, conference on this, or hearing on this, this week or next, about um, whether we should go on blockchain, whether the Fed should, you know, uh, digitize the U.S. dollar and put it on the blockchain, and the one argument that kept they, they kept coming up was Chinese that the Chinese are beating us and that they're already doing this, and it was very much this this imperial sort of you know um, thing, which which I find to be completely bogus. Um, and I'm glad that Eli said empire because I think the the U.S. empire is much stronger than the talking points seem to make it. And part of that is just the dollar supremacy. We, the dollar is the world currency. And a lot of that has to do with the size of our military and our monopoly on violence all over the world. China is nowhere near to um, competing with us on that realm. I mean, the fact that they are invested in US treasury um, is a mutual, like it's mutual destruction, but more for them than for us. And part of this is, I think, the ability that, you know, our ability to print money and our ability to dominate these sectors has everything to do um, with the empire building. And so I, I do think it is used as a rhetorical weapon, but, but there isn't a real competition anymore. I mean, I think if we're gonna talk about monopolies, the US, the dollar is a monopoly on currency. The EU doesn't come close. I think the Chinese currency doesn't come close. It is, it, is, it is hard to reckon with. And so I think any argument that, oh, well, Apple will lose its share, Facebook will lose its share, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. It's, we're too far ahead. Um, and, you know, also, so what? You know, I mean, I think you, you, um, you know, uh, you don't, you know, you don't, uh, Zuckerberg, I mean, I listened to his Libra thing, right? I mean, look at what happened to Libra. They're like, oh, we're just, we're going to go and, and do this thing. And it was just based on, you know, competition with the dollar and it fell, it fell apart. And I, th I think you don't, you, um, you don't have to buy their, their talking points. I, I find them to be not at all convincing. Eli, do you want to add something? Because I have more questions are coming and I, so... No, no, I just, I didn't, no, I thought, I thought, I, I thought I was, I, I would agree with what you, what you were saying. I think this is a really big challenge because you're right. These, these arguments fly and people, uh, and this is how, you know, these big corporations become, you know, more than just big corporations. They, they become ambassadors. They become, you know, growth engines and all over the world. And it's, it's always been a big challenge. Uh, uh, you know, how are you going to, on one hand, create a very small competitive anti-monopoly economy inside but still be able to, you know, compete with the big boys outside. Mm -hmm. So there is Bruno Renzetti that asks, uh, are referendums or some other form of direct democracy a good way to bypass interest groups and promote changes? What is the track record of these forms of direct democracy? Can democracy be captured as well? So who wants to answer? Mosa, you seem to, go ahead. Me, uh, yes, democracy can be captured, but um, I think capture, you know, if we're going to define it more narrowly, it's where uh, a certain subset of people's interests are taken precedent over others. And so, if you do reform democracy such that you do actually have a majoritarian democracy, I don't think that's capture anymore. I think it's just the majority's will, and and part of it is going to be convincing the majority of people they could be wrong. But I think democracies can be very wrong and go down the wrong path um, and in not necessarily good way. But I, I, I think capture um, uh, seems to me to, to have more anti-democratic nature by definition, because you're actually um, uh, usurping the will of, of the majority through some industry kind of um, uh, push in some specific field. Actually, as, as a reminder, John Matusaka, who is affiliated with the Spiegel Center and has presented it many times at the Spiegel Center, has a new book 
called, I think, Gladham Rule, that, that uh, documents precisely how direct democracy could be affixed to that. And uh, we're going to host him uh, at the Spiegel Center in the fall. So, Bruno, if you're interested in more, uh, that's, uh, that's the answer. Uh, now, another question that is coming from uh, Lucas uh, Gribbler. Um, what made the New Deal different? Why and how did we manage to build such a unique coalition back then? Uh, it was just the 1929 crash? Who wants to answer? Um, I'll just say that uh, I think the fact that there wasn't a bailout after the crash actually matters. Uh, a lot of rich and powerful people lost a lot of their money and therefore when Roosevelt comes in in 32, the, the power dynamics are, are quite different. So in that sense, I think, uh, you know, the fact that the Federal Reserve didn't do what it did, obviously, it, I have no doubt that it created a much longer uh, depression. But on the other hand, it did allow for a, uh, a, a new politics to emerge, a politics that, you know, let's not forget, Roosevelt uh, uh, knew how to use this kind of uh, populist anti uh, uh, billionaire uh, critique. He was the master of it. And so in that sense, that's clearly one of the issues. Uh, of course, there are many others. Uh, I think the fact that uh, the New Deal managed to create new political co coalitions where, at least in some ways, the glue that held it together wasn't your usual uh, uh, politics, uh, but it was actually something that could create a coalition around economic issues, around social issues. Let's not forget, he creates a coalition that uh, blacks in Chicago and white supremacists in the South are all voting for the same party. And I think the way you do that is by creating, you know, the glue that, that keeps it together is, you know, economic issues. So obviously that, that was unique. And, and of course, I just, you know, this is, you know, just broader history, but I just think that uh, uh, capitalism was much younger then. It was much newer. Uh, people uh, were willing to, you know, think outside the box. I think people don't realize the crisis of legitimacy uh, that the, the market had in the 1930s that allowed uh, creative uh, solutions and, and also, uh, which of course, some of them were also clearly market solutions, but still it, it, it created kind of like, like I'll just say this, the 1930s in my mind are the most creative decade as far as economic ideas, maybe in history. So I know that Mercer has to run uh, pretty yeah. soon. I wanna ask uh, one last question and I summarize because it's a long question. That's to do with, uh, this person, Stephen uh, Sklibas, is troubled by the suggestion that there should be more political influence with the Federal Reserve and say, why do you think political influence would improve monetary policy when its influence seems pretty poor in fiscal policy? Um, I will say this. The, the fact that we think that there isn't political po um, uh, you know, uh, uh, effect on the Fed right now is a myth. That, that's, the, that's the big problem, is that it's all run by you know, technical monetarists using spread charts. That was a Greenspan hoax. It's always been a political influence. And so I think it's, it's uh, something that we just need to say, we, we do have political influence. And it turns out that they just meet with bankers. And the bankers do get a lot of intellectual sway at the Fed and the, the revolving door idea, all of this stuff. And so just need to counter that, right? Bring in some other, other people who are focused on other things. And so I don't think, I don't think we have a political free Fed, as much as it says it is. It is not, I think. Okay, so thank you very much. We're running out of time. This was fantastic, even if a little thank bit you. depressing, because my understanding is to create a new pol political coalition for anti we need to have a major depression. And uh, no. well, that's, I don't know. But, uh, hopefully, uh, there, were, there are better ways to do it. Uh, but I learned a lot, and I thank you very much, and I thank you all the listeners, and I uh, hope to see you back in the fall. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you, Luigi.